here's a pretty good article about service dogs versus emotional support animals. Um, let's check it out. Service dogs versus emotional support animals and sites that make you think you're getting a service dog. Pet lovers across the country celebrated National Love Your Pet Day Tuesday. But some say pet owners take that love too far. When they pass, off, pass their pets off as service animals and do so unrightfully. We visited Service Dogs for America in Judd, North Dakota to learn how the easy mix-up messes things up for those who really need it. The training site may not be large, but Service Dogs for America staff keep their dogs physically and mentally exercised. We train service dogs for mobility issues, seizure issues, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and PTSD, Executive Director Jenny Broadcorb said. Broadcorb says real service dogs, like the ones she trains, are covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. That dog must be trained in a very specific manner to intervene or to provide tasks for someone with a disability, she said. Broadcorb says it can be frustrating when pets, such as emotional support or therapy animals, are mistaken for a highly trained service dog. An emotional support animal is a pet that is not required to have any training at all, she said. Emotional support animals are covered under the Fair Housing Act, meaning even if a home doesn't allow pets, it can possibly make an exception with the proper papers. Bismarck, North Dakota resident Krista Werzer has an ASA certified cat, ASA being emotional support animal, an ASA certified cat. My doctor actually suggested it because have always had pets my whole life, and I was raised on a farm, so I was constantly surrounded by my animals, she said. And when I lived alone for the first time, I suddenly just got really depressed. I got Calvin, and within a week, I felt so much better just having somebody there. Wurzer has many other pets as well, like fish and an axolotl. <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce that, and a snake. But she says those can usually go with her whenever she goes, as many landlords consider them like furniture. But Calvin the cat was certified to ensure he goes wherever she goes. And while even Jenny Broadcorb agrees emotional support and therapy pets serve their purpose, she says many take advantage of the system. One of her staffers, Jeremiah Erickson, works in client support. He's also a veteran with PTSD. Served in the Army a couple tours in Iraq, Erickson said. He says it's thanks to his service dog, Ida, that he's here working today. I hear that. I was on the brink of suicide, he said. Can't work here if I'm dead. Boy, he's short on words, isn't he? And it was at the Denver International Airport that he and Ida encountered a man claiming to have a fellow service dog. He had to jump in front of his dog. He turned around and says, Oh, my service dog doesn't really like other dogs, Erickson said. But, but Broadcorb says a real service dog should be no more visible than the eyeglasses you wear in public. Just like glasses are a tool to aid it aid and inability, they don't disturb others around the person wearing them, and no one would come up and try to take them off the person. If it's going after other animals, it's not a well-trained do dog, Broadcorb said. That dog is not service dog material, so you run the risk, then, of an aggressive dog really doing some serious damage, which Broadcorb says could be a matter of taking away someone's lifeline. Broadcorb tells us many sites offering to certify dogs as service animals and emotional support animals, she forgot to mention, are predatory. 
and only service dogs are recognized under the Americans with Disabilities Act. A service dog from our organization comes with a price tag of $20,000, Broadcorp said. And yet Google service or emotional support animal and plenty of ads pop up promising quick certifications. We wanted to see just how easily we could certify our pets here at Valley News Live. So first we tried the betta fish, Larry Marlin, Jr. the fourth. Betta fish, Larry Marlin, Jr. the fourth. Okay. After a quick free pre-screener with CertiPet, the website asked me to pay $199 to get to a much longer screening. I answered it as honestly as I could. Am I suicidal? No. Am I often anxious? I'm a reporter, so yes, pretty much always. In the end, I was denied. I received an email saying, hi there, I'm sorry, I cannot approve a fish as an ASA for housing or travel. Later, a longer email came stating the following. This is Amanda Williams, the licensed mental health professional servicing your case. Unfortunately, at this time, you do not seem to meet my requirements for an ASA letter. I apologize for the inconvenience, but I have strict legal and ethical guidelines on who may and may not be approved for an ASA letter by me. If you have any questions regarding this decision, please do not hesitate to email me and ask. Fair enough. And I thought I was refunded most of the $199. I found they took a $24.99 cut for the therapist time. And by the way, the therapist is actually a licensed social worker. Though when I reached out to Haley Nydick, the director of clinical development, and also by her signature, a licensed social worker, I was told via email. Actually, there are a number of licensed mental health professionals. Here is the full list. Psychologist, a licensed social worker, licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed professional counselor. Nydick also sent the following statement. Regarding our evaluation process, we are deeply invested in working with licensed therapists who provide thorough evaluations with each client. If an emotional support animal letter is issued due to clinical appropriateness, that is typically only one portion of the treatment plan recommendation. Many of our therapists are avail available to provide long-term telemental health services to their clients. We think of the evaluation as a starting off point for creating meaningful change in people's lives. While there are other companies that auto-generate letters, we are working to make our evaluation process even more thorough. All of our clients are matched with a therapist who is licensed in their state and who is available to thoroughly assess them for the clinical necessity of an ASA as well as make recommendations to help them improve their described symptoms. We are committed to further legitimizing the emo emotional support animal evaluation process in order to assure that these letters are provided only to individuals who truly need them. Finally, it's worth noting this was at the bottom of the email. Licensed mental health professional, please note that this email should not be considered as professional advice or guidance. Always use your professional discretion for any counseling related decision or action. Not to be deterred, we tried to certify Asha the dog next, this time with the website usaservicedogregistration.com. So we refer to that as US, USA Service Dog Registration. Although this one did not cost 20000 as a service dog might, for just $29.99 plus shipping and handling, all we had to do was fill out a form with basic information and answer why we wanted to certify the dog. <coughs> we wrote 
because she makes me happy. The card came just a few days later, complete with Ash's picture on it, stating the card meets a requirement under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Yet Jenny Broadcorb of Service Dogs for America says real service dogs are covered under the ADA with a finite definition. As a dog that is trained to perform a set number of tasks to mitigate a disability, she said. According to ADA.gov, dogs whose sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support do not qualify as service animals. So as we see here, the dog must be specifically task trained. <laughs> and as a help for people, I'm going to talk about from my experience, from my watching legal cases, from me talking to advocates, uh, people in lawsuits, um, a guidance on what a task is. Um, Nowadays, the litmus test for a task is trained recognition of um, a condition um, of a command, recognition of, of a need for assistance, and the response. Um, alert dogs do this. They are trained to do this spontaneously. They recognize a, a change in your condition that you train them to. And then they automatically respond in the trained manner. Um, it can also be commands. You know, like a person in a wheelchair. They need an item that's on the floor or across the room. And they cue the dog ver via a command to go get that item for them. That counts as well, you know, that the dog is trained to the command. They recognize the command. And then they respond and do the task. Um, either one is okay. Um, now, what is not considered a task is things that normal pet dogs usually do. That includes jumping in your lap. That includes licking your face. That includes, you know, climbing on you, hugging you. You know, stuff that normal pet dogs do on their own every day. So those are not considered tasks. Now, um, one problematic task that some people are using solely as their only task, and I think it's a dangerous road to go down to do that, is deep pressure therapy. Um, if the deep pressure therapy, the process of the deep pressure therapy is highly trained so that it is clearly recognizable as something a pet dog wouldn't know how to do, um, it could count as a task. But the, the problem with deep pressure therapy is dogs crawl on their people and lay on them, sit on them every day. Pet dogs do that all the time on their own. So it's a problem. So if you're going to do deep pressure therapy, great, fine, do it. If it helps, it helps me. Do it. But um, you have to highly train it or you're going to want another task to go along with. I don't even claim the deep pressure therapy unless we're getting into an intensive list of what my dog does. Um, sorry, itchy eyes. Maybe an allergy thing going on. Um, I don't even go into the deep pressure therapy unless we're doing an intensive listing of what my dog does because I I don't need to claim it as a task. He's got other tasks, you know, tasks that are more firm that I can mention. You know, people don't need to know about that. They, they you know, unless they're seeing it and they're asking me about it, people don't need to know about it. It's, you know, I just give them, you know, a gatekeeper I'm going to give a list of other tasks to. <laughs> So it doesn't matter if it's highly trained or not, in my case, because I have other tasks to rely on. Um, now, they mentioned a $20,000 cost for a service dog. That can or cannot be true. So um, I'm going to run through 
how you would go about getting a service dog, the costs of a service dog. So there are the free dogs trained by agencies. There are agencies out there that provide these dogs free of charge. Um, if you're going to go with that option, you need a lot of time. You need um, plenty of time on your hands because the wait list is, you know, around seven years to get a free dog from one of these agencies that, you know, give free dogs. Um, okay. I, I have notes here I'm, I'm looking at, so I, I kind of stay on target and don't ramble. Um, and this, the, a second option is you can go to an agency that you have to pay for the dog. Um, that means you're going to have to have the cash. You're going to have to have the plenty of the cash, the 20000 or whatever cash. Now, the problem for some people with these two options are that not all disabilities are trained for. Um, there are plenty of disabilities that have no one training for them. So you can't just get a dog from these methods, whether you have time or you have the cash, you can't get these dogs pre-trained for these medical conditions. <clears throat> Which leads us to the third option. You could owner train. Um, with owner training, you can train for any disability. Whatever your needs are, you can train for that. Um, now, if you owner train and paying an agency for a service dog, I, I lump in paying a trainer to train the dog to hand back to you as the same in there. You're going to need plenty of cash. Um, if you owner train, you've got to have time because it, I would count on at least two years where, you know, you can parent the dog, you know, throughout the day, every day. Um, it's more intensive when they're younger and as they get older, it starts to drop off, but I would count on two years of training time. So you've got to have extra time and a lot of extra time the first six months. You also need some cash. Um, good dogs cost. It's just the way it is. If you want a known background, if you want health clearances, you know, to have been done in the background on the, on the parents, grandparents, and so forth, to make the probability that your dog is healthy, um, it's going to cost. We're talking purebred dogs in this case. It's going to cost. 2000 is not out of line for a good purebred dog. Um, then you have to have cash for a trainer to help you, a mentor trainer to help you. Um, that's going to cost you some, but we're not talking $20,000. Um, on my service dog, now understand I've been doing this. I've been a pro private service dog trainer for over 20 years. So knowing that, you know that I've walked into a service dog with most of the equipment. Now, periodically I have to replace equipment as it, as it wears, as it gets old. There are certain equ equipment that that will last the lifetime of a dog, you know, we're seven to 10 years. So by the time I'm getting a new puppy, that equipment's pretty much worn out or it's going to go out on me. So I just replace it when I get a new puppy. So understanding I'm not buying the full Megilla, all the equipment, everything, all, you know, all that first year. I've got some stuff that, you know, is working for me. Some things I'm, I'm replacing. What I spent on my service dog his first year was about four or $5,000, 2000 to get him. And then there were vet bills and vet checks. Um, there was equipment. There was toys, you know, uh, puppies, 
need chewies, for instance. If you don't have chewable items for your puppy, they will chew your things and they will learn to chew human things. And that's a bad thing. You know, so there are expenses, you know, when a dog's older, they may not chew as much. So, you know, it becomes less pressing. It's less expensive to buy chewies because you don't need to replace them that often. Um, so in the end, it turned out, I think it was like 5K and I kept track of the receipts. Um, that was food and everything. Complete care of my dog for the first year. It was about 5K. I kept receipts for medical deduction purposes. Um, so it's nowhere near the 20,000, but it's, it's still a goodly amount of money. Um, the dog was less, quite, quite a bit less expensive the second year. By the second year, he's grown into his adult size. I've purchased his adult service dog equipment because now he's attained adult, you know, approximately adult size. Um, you know, he's got all his toys, you know, I've got any equipment I needed to have. Um, so the, the cost went down. <sighs> uh, spend $80 a month, maybe, on food. Um, I, I don't calculate in the vet bills cause my dogs, I do a lot of preventative. My dogs are usually healthy, you know, but vet bills could play in. Um, so $80 a month. So we're looking 1500 to 2000 the second year. Um, at the end of the second year, he had his own health clearances as an individual done. Um, so that was about 600 bucks, six to 700 bucks to do all his health clearances. Um, so that's around about the cost of, of owner training, but we're not figuring in here the trainer because I am a trainer. So I don't need to hire a trainer. Now I did pay for certain tests. Um, I did pay to compete. I, I try to compete in obedience and get the dog CD title. Um, kind of proof of training, you know, documentation by several third parties that my dog can do certain maneuvers. Um, so I did pay for tests or competition and I don't know, tests, 30 something dollars a piece. Um, the CGC tests I paid 30 something dollars a piece for. A uh, competition, a two-day show, and I sign up for both days. You know, I either, you've got to get three times, qualify three times to get your CD title. I do both days of the show. Um, if he, he or she nails it those two days and I have one left, I've got to get. So the next show, I'll sign up for the two days just in case the dog bombs. You know, mine don't usually, but it can happen. They have a bad day. They, I, I do this quite early on. So they're teenagers usually, if not before. Teenage brains can be obnoxious. So I, I sign up for both just in case they bomb one day. Um, so $100 a show, two days competing, $100. And I might do that twice. If my dog is real doing really good twice. Um, if my dog is being a bratty teenager, I might have to do it three times. Um, so I, I don't pay for a trainer, but I do pay for tests. So you're going to have to figure out, you know, what resources you have and you're going to have to pay for a trainer in, in addition. And that first year, you know, it could go to 6,000 you know, easily paying a trainer. Um, and a trainer is necessary. Whether or not you need an outside trainer depends on your level of training knowledge, but also on the level of difficulty the dog's giving you. Um, and each dog is an individual. They're all different. You can 
have no problem with an easier to train dog and nothing but problems, you know, with a different dog. So you, you kind of have to evaluate first, what do you know about training? Because you trained a dog to sit does not make you a dog trainer. It, it means you understand the very, very basic concepts of training. Um, that's not enough. You need to have somebody to advise you. You know, somebody with mid-level knowledge still might want a trainer on tap that they don't utilize all the time, but that they can go to if they run into a problem or get stuck. Um, then there are people that are advanced trainers, amateur trainers. Um, people that compete in high level obedience, you know, in shows, they know all they need to know to train a service dog. I mean, it's not that hard. If you're training in a, training a dog for high level obedience competition, it, that is tasks. They're just tasks created, you know, for the obedience competition. If you can train those tasks, you can train other tasks. Not a problem. Um, so you need to evaluate what your training knowledge is. Realistically, what is your training knowledge? If you know you're you're mid or beginning, you need to have a trainer on tap, or you're going to ruin dogs. You're just going to ruin dogs, and you can't keep. If you love dogs, you cannot keep ruining dogs. Um, and ruining means, it could mean anything from not being able to be a service dog, but being an okay pet, to borking it up so bad that they're a dog that people don't even want to keep as a pet. Those dogs will end up in the shelter repeatedly until they're killed. You can't be doing that. You know, if you try once and, you know, it doesn't work out well once, well, we've all had that. There was a dog early on that I worked with. I chose it, um, assuming during the early test that I do, I assumed one of the tests meant something, but it turned out it meant the complete opposite, my inexperience at the time. That dog was completely inappropriate for service work, but I had done a good enough foundation that the dog could go on to be a pet dog with no problem. The family that got him thought he was great because he sit, stay, down, come, all of that. So um, we've all had a dog. If we've been in it long enough, we've all had a dog it didn't work out with. You know, so one is not all that bad. So you regroup, learn from your mistake, and, you know, do some more learning and then eventually hit it again. You know, but if you've done two and three five in a row and it's not working, you either need to quit or you need to get a good trainer on tap. You know, you can't keep ruining dogs. So um, I guess that's what I wanted to impart about the service dog process. Um, there's no way on God's green earth that you can pay a fee and get a card and a vest, and that makes your dog a service dog. It doesn't even make your dog an emotional support dog. Um, those cards and vests are worthless for anything. They are a scam to part stupid people from their money. Um, it, it, it doesn't work. The only thing that makes a dog a service dog is one... The legal disability, your disability has to meet the standards of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And not all disabilities do. Your disability has to meet that standard. Two, the dog has to be properly trained for the work. That means public access to be a highly appropriate in public. That means the task training, all of it. Um, that's the only thing that makes a dog a service dog. The only thing that makes an ASA dog an ASA is a doctor's letter from a doctor that you have personally seen that has evaluated you, has seen you, has, you know, treated you. A diagnosed disability 
that meets the standards of the Fair Housing Act, a letter from that doctor who has diagnosed and or treated you. That's the only thing that makes a dog an emotional support animal. You can't decide. You don't get to decide. Once you are diagnosed with a disability, you know, and your disability meets the criteria, then you can decide that you want a service dog or you want an emotional support animal. Then you have to go through the work to, to have it happen. For the service dog, it's the proper training. For the ASA dog, you have to talk to your doctor and your doctor has to clear it. ASA animals are pets. That's all they are. ASA animals are pets like any other pet, except they have doctor clearance to be in no pet housing. And if you have the proper paperwork to go on an air flight with you, that's it. That's all. Um, and those two ways are the only ways you can have a service dog or an ASA is through medical diagnosis first, then the proper training of the dog, hopefully with your, your doctor's backup, medical backup, um, the proper training of the dog for service work. And in the case of the ASA, your doctor backing you up with a letter that you need to have the dog in your housing. That's the only way. You can't decide. You can't diagnose yourself. Not allowed. Um, it's the only two ways to get these dogs. So anyway, I hope this was educational for people that didn't know, didn't understand. Um, this is the real skinny on all of that. So until next time, bye.